today I'm going to take a look at two Apple CD-ROM drives. These are both external units and they come from back in the day when they were scuzzy and they were huge. This is a modern external five and a quarter inch bay and you can tell it's quite a bit shorter. I think the main reason for that bulkier switch mode power supplies in addition to the fact that these are using SCSI connectors. So they just physically take up more space. Plus um, older CD-ROM drives generally had audio outputs. So it also has um, extra space put aside for some RCA jacks. Both of them have the same interface and same specs. They're both SCSI 1. They both have uh, actual audio on the front with uh, headphone jacks. And the main difference between the two, other than speed, this is a the 150 and this is the 600. The 150 is a 1X, so it transfers at 150 kilobytes a second. And the uh, this is the 4X, the 600. There's also a 2X, which is the 300 model. The other difference being, this uses a Caddy. Does anyone remember Caddies? I do. Um, I never actually had a system that used caddies from like my own use, but uh, I did use them at school. You would uh, load a disc in here, and then when it inserts into the drive, it actually opens up. And this thing keeps ejecting it because it's obviously detecting that there's no disc inside the drive. This one's the same thing, except it's got a caddy. That looks a little familiar. This one's a little beat up on the top. Uh, I can't remember if that's from me or just from the fact that I've had this thing for like 10 years. But uh, yeah, it should still work just fine. And I'm going to try and not damage any of this stuff because I do want to... Oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just put these on eBay. I don't need them anymore. But uh, I do want to make sure that they survive to at least some degree. Other models actually go for quite a bit of money, like the... Um, the 600 and the 300 they usually go for like $50 or more, um, especially if they're confirmed working. One of the reasons why they go for a lot of money is because you need a genuine Apple CD-ROM drive to boot properly in most cases. So even if you find a CD-ROM drive, a SCSI one, they often don't boot. You have to get one with a proper ROM or firmware on it. And these will also boot into um, Apple's Unix. Aux AUX. Okay, so the main layout of this seems pretty straightforward. We just have the Sony CD-ROM drive unit. Uh, quite heavily shielded. These things are very heavy, by the way. And the power supply, which looks like it's a, uh, a switch mode power supply. And uh, just the wiring with some really, really old tape on it and the huge SCSI ribbon cable. As you can see, this is the 150. The third model, the original was just the Apple CD-SC and then they made an SC Plus which removed a fan. And the original SC had a fan, but they found that it, it would suck dust into the unit. So they got rid of the fan on later models. But anyway, this is technically the third model. And uh, yeah, it's still the same speed. So I've removed the drive. You can see the giant ribbon cable and uh, just how many connections there are on a, an older drive. Normally you just have a serial ATA and power. Previously we had power, the interface, an audio connection for the RCA jacks. And these are, this is just a pin header, which is used for uh, the SCSI ID switch. Now uh, SCSI 1 could uh, pick any of eight SCSI IDs ranging from zero to seven and seven was, was reserved for the uh, Macintosh, it was the, the controller, and the uh, zero was usually an internal hard drive. And I think three was generally an internal CD-ROM drive, if my memory serves me correct. So uh, you'd just set, set this to like five or something and then you'd be able to use it. And the back of the drive itself is nicely labeled with the audio pinout and the ID selection. I think it was just used using like a binary system where it was uh, one bit and then uh, two bits and three bits. So you just work out how many uh, you needed to set for that. And uh, yeah, it even has the power supply pinout and the tolerances, which is a little unusual. It's the CDU54125. Assembled in the US from components made in Japan. That's something you don't see every day. 
complexity of this drive mechanism is just insane. There's so much stuff in here. No wonder this thing weighs so much. Look at all these guide rails. In a modern drive, it's seriously like one bar and a little plastic lead screw and this teeny tiny sensor head. This thing has these huge linear rails, which have magnets on them for some reason. It's probably like a linear actuator. And there's a locking mechanism down here. You can kind of see it. It's got these little indents where it's locking the drive head at set intervals. So I guess if it loses power at any specific spot, it can't move very far. <laughs> so there's obviously a mechanism like a solenoid to move this out of the way to unlock the drive so it can move freely. And that's just to, to handle the locking. There's also a large motor with it has markings for an optical reader <laughs> so it's it's obviously calibrating its speed using these uh these dashes because I, I guess there wasn't enough feedback like they didn't have like motor feedback or really precise controllers back then and yeah there's several large chips in there too let me just uh, see if i can move the head out of the way maybe if uh, i go this way there sanyo sanyo made chip Sony made chip, you know, there's probably like 35 chips in there altogether. So yeah, pretty impressive design and uh, it kind of explains why it was so heavy. The PCB is huge and I'm not going to take it out because there's so many connections to it and I really don't want to do a full disassembly on this thing, like I said, because I, I want to keep it working. And uh, these things are pretty difficult to get apart and then put back together because you have to make sure all the optics are okay. Plus there's just a million connections. You can see all the connections down here, but they're using a big copper sheet for uh, some uh, shielding. You can even see it's been soldered to the PCB. And Sony generally writes our silk screens on all the parts for, or all the IDs for all the parts on, uh, on the back. So you can actually figure out what you're looking at from the bottom because uh, this is where you're going to be doing most of your testing if you're trying to repair one of these. And yes, you would actually repair things like this back in the day. And there's even a whole bunch of uh, test pads and they're all labeled. Even the trimmers are, are labeled. This is SD offset. Pretty standard CD-ROM drive from the time, but I mean, it just goes to show how things have changed. I mean, this thing is so complex and expensive to make compared to what we'd see now. I suspect even the 600 model will be complex, but not this crazy level of complexity. I dug out the power supply. Uh, this is definitely an older one, so you want to check it, uh, check the capacitors to see if there's any charge left on them. This does appear to have a, uh, a bleeder resistor, or at least it did uh, drop the voltage pretty quickly. So uh, it's actually a quite nice power supply. They're using very high quality caps and I mean, they're all uh, they're all Nippon Chemicon ones, and uh, they're all in good shape. Oh, sorry, this is a Rubicon, the uh, main uh, input capacitor, but still Rubicon, excellent brand, and it looks well protected, and uh, it's well laid out, and uh, it's made by Mitsumi, so I expect this thing to last quite some time. I've taken the cover off this one, the the 600, and it's basically the same design as all external drives are. It's just the drive and the power supply. This one looks a lot cleaner because it's got like a nice metal shield over it that just looks a lot more professional and more modern. Not that it really matters. The aesthetics aren't very important. Uh, this one, as you can see from the bottom, is the 600E, the E being external. There's also an I, which is just the same drive inside your computer, which, hey, look, it's a 600i. So yeah, they just packaged them in an external case. Uh, this one is labeled Apple, but really it's made by Matsushita. The front bezel on this thing uses these deteriorating clips. I was gonna point that out. And <laughs> the bottom is already broken. That's how I know they're, uh, they're just falling apart. So um, I think, I can probably just like glue something back together, whatever. I was expecting that. Um, I actually have a Power Mac 7500 that you look at it and the, it just crumbles. This plastic 
is just at the point where it just like you can just touch it and it just falls apart. So I don't know what the deal is with that, but this some of the plastics Apple used just have deteriorated so badly. Same arrangement of connectors. We have the same SCSI ID selector, the audio, and the uh, power. But this one, the SCSI cable was actually half out. Um, as far as I know, this thing still worked. So it was probably just hanging on by a thread, but I guess it's a good thing I opened it up to... Uh, check because this thing was about to fall out and I'm sure if I had shipped this from an eBay sale it would have been received with a supposedly uh, inoperable drive. So that should be it for the connections. There we go. And again it's the same exactly the same arrangement. Uh, pretty much all SCSI drives use the same setup just the IDs and uh, uh, SCSI power and um, audio. Uh, this one does actually have a termination power resistor, and they often have a setting for termination. All SCSI interfaces have to have a, a termination resistor at the end, so what they do is they uh, usually incorporate it into the drive, and it's optional. But um, with external drives, traditionally, you would have just the two connections, and you'd put an external terminator on it, so they'll leave that out on this one, and they'll uh, keep it disconnected. Well, the board seems pretty much just as complex as the previous one. And again, it's uh, nicely labeled. You've got uh, all the silk screening for many of the components on both sides. And the mechanism looks much simpler, partially because there's no caddy that greatly reduces the complexity of the unit. But um, it also just looks like they've made a smaller motor and uh, otherwise made things more a little more efficient. But uh, this is as far as I'm gonna go into the, the drive for this one because uh, the plastic, I'm concerned about the plastic on this one. So uh, it hasn't broken yet, but if I take it apart anymore, I have to remove the front bezel and that'll probably break the plastic. So uh, this is as far as I'm gonna go. It's actually kind of a clever design. They have all the interface cables underneath and uh, a little raised platform for the power supply. The uh, metal shielding just pops right off. This power supply is also in really good shape. It's got a uh, similar design. I mean, the components are smaller, but it's, it looks like it's a larger board, so it probably evens out. I mean, it's a much shorter design, but uh, it's well-built. Power supply tray removes quite easily, so you can uh, get to all the connections, because I knew that would be a real pain to try and hook up the SCSI connection and all that through uh, that little itty-bitty gap that you're left when the thing is assembled that's about it for these two yeah they're just external drives with power supplies and a SCSI drive in it but you know it's nice to look back at when Apple used to make quality peripherals well built and they obviously have survived 20 plus years with the exception of the uh, kind of janky plastic on this one